So now that we know what a K is and how it's defined as products over reactants, the next thing is to realize that since these reactions are reversible, you have to be super, super careful to define specifically what reaction you're talking about every time you write a K. So if the reaction is not given to you in the problem, you gotta write one down. Again, because there's no reason that I should write forward on the you know, left or right or whatever. These are all present in the solution at the same time, or in this case, in the flask, because they're gases, at the same time. So, um, as it turns out though, that there is a relationship between the Ks when we write them forward or backward. So if NO2 is forming N2O4, we would write the K as, so there's two NO2s notice, so that exponent comes into play over here. Um, so, but we would write it as products over reactants, and so here's our measured value of that. If I flip the reaction around, so N2O4 is decomposing to form two NO2s, we we'll just flip the KC around, which means what we are doing is inverting these two things. So if you go one divided by 4.72, or one divided by 0.212, you're gonna get the other number. It's like magic. They're just, they're just inverted. You just flip them over. So the numbers are two. This is a handy thing. There's gonna be situations where a reaction that I need is in the textbook, but it's backwards. Well, cool. We just flip it around and invert the number the textbook gives us. Another thing that can happen is maybe I have different ratios, but the same reaction. So two to four instead of two to one. Well, that's okay too. You're just gonna change the exponents. Um, and so the rules say that if, you know, you can simplify these exponents like so. So then mathematically, if we have a reference value for the reaction that we have doubled, all we do is square that value. It works for tripling or quadrupling or whatever you're trying to do. You just take whatever the KC is and raise it to that power. Okay. Um, that's, that's powerful. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to let that pun sink in. Yeah, that's a good one. It's a powerful tool because we don't always want to have to remeasure everything, right? It's much easier to go look at a reference and, and use that to get a quick calculation done than have to go measure the kinetics and the and the equilibrium constants myself. So these are nice tricks. Keep them in your back pocket when you're doing problems. So now we get to talk about one of the most important concepts in this class, and that is our ocean chemistry. Uh, we don't get to talk about the environmental chapter, which is chapter 18. Uh, we just don't have time for it. So I integrate those a lot of those topics into this chapter, because that's where they come up. Um, so the ocean is a very complex system of equilibrium reactions, and I've selected the most important one here. This is called the bicarbonate buffer system. So I'm going to name these for you. It's a good practice, by the way, for you to pause the video right now and see if you know the names of these chemicals. Okay, so carbonic acid that's aqueous, so it's dissolved. Of course, that comes from the air, right? We breathe out carbon, carbon, carbon dioxide all the time. Uh, it's non-flammable gas. Uh, we also produce it in huge amounts in our factories and our cars, mostly factories, but also cars. Um, and so as the amount of carbon dioxide in the world has increased, we get more aqueous, we get more dissolved carbon dioxide. So that shifts the reaction to form more carbonic acid. This is in your soda, by the way. It has an influence on the taste and it's also carbonation. Having a higher amount of carbonic acid means it's gonna to shift to form more bicarbonate. Bicarbonate, this is why we call this the bicarbonate buffer system. HCO3 minus is bicarbonate. Um, and finally, the reaction will wanna to shift towards more carbonate. There's a problem with that though. I'll show you in a second. So long time ago, this was taken directly from a, um, I added the equilibriums because they didn't copy very well, but this was taken from an actual scientific article from quite a long time ago um, when it was hard to write scientific notation on typewriters. And so we used logarithms of K. And so you can undo that. We did that in the last chapter. This is a very common practice, but you can find 
the value of k simply by going like 10 to the negative 1.46. And so that's the k of the, the CO2 gas dissolving to form carbonic acid directly. So that would be like a reaction like this. Okay. Um, and then of course, carbonic acid forms bicarbonate so that you could find a K for that. You could, you could figure out, is it more products or reactants based on the value of K? And once you have carbonic acid, it's going to, it's going to try to fall apart and form some carb carbonate. Oh, 10.33. There we go. Um, so, so on and so forth. And of course it can skip steps too. It can go directly from CO2 to carbonate. So it could go like this and very unlikely, but it does happen. CO2 can go all the way. This is a multi-step reaction, which makes it unlikely. So for that, for the multi-step reaction, you can actually, it's a fun math exercise. You can actually take the fact that each step is multiplied together like that, however many steps you have. So you can do the calculation if you like, but um, this turns out to be a very, very small K value, which means it doesn't happen very often. Again, because multiple steps and the kinetics of multi-step reactions tend to be slower, uh, but it does happen, all right? And so um, you can find the kind of effects of changing each part of the um, equilibrium system using K. Here's our general process, okay? This is just a handy thing to have around. Um, so I said that if you had too much CO2, it would shift to form carbonic, which would shift to form bicarbonate. And then I said, well, there's a problem with going any further. Um, this picture kind of help explain that problem, right? So CO2 gas dissolves in the water and then it shifts to carbonic acid. And then it shifts to bicarbonate. We're making a hydrogen ion when we do that. Hydrogen is acid. Hydrogen ion is acid. So it can be written as H plus or as hydronium. They are, they are two equivalent things. We should know the names of them, Hydro, hydronium and hydrogen ion. So as we shift to the right here, whoop, we're making, we're making acid. As it turns out, the ocean is already saturated with carbonate. So that system is actually calcium carbonate most of the time. So you have an equilibrium that goes roughly like this and it's already saturated. What that means is water can't accommodate any more carbonate. So we're putting more and more CO2 into the atmosphere and it's shifting and shifting and shifting and building up bicarbonate and hydrogen ions. But there's no ability to alleviate that stress to the system by making carbonate because it's already saturated. And so this creates problem for aquatic life and a lot of things are dying as a result. So we call this ocean acidification. Um, and it's happening in different parts of the ocean and we've been able to trace it back pretty pretty well to the industrial revolution so here's a graph of carbon emissions this was um current through like 2005. so there's this really cool website i love data okay i like i'm a scientist and um i like to see trends and how things are changing over time so our our world in data.org has these really interactive graphs and so if we you could actually look going back in time. So one of the arguments against climate change being a thing, which by the way, in case you aren't aware, scientists are not debating that. It is absolutely a problem. Um, areas of our world are colder than they should be in some cases and hotter in other cases. Our weather systems are changing and it's a direct result of CO2 emissions and the changes in the climate that have occurred. So we have data going back to like 800,000 BCE. So that was a really long time ago. And yeah, the, uh, the uh, amount of CO2 does vary over time. That's a fact. But um, you see right here in like the, the 1800 period, I can't quite get my mouse on it, but around the 1800 period, it suddenly shoots up. That's because of us. That's because we started burning fossil fuels. We started heating our homes. 
um, you know, with oil and we started building factories in the early 1900s. So this variation is normal. This is not for our planet. That's what climate change is in a very short nutshell. So you can move this slider to get a kind of a more, um, how do you put that? Like a, a more detailed view. Um, so when it starts to really take off beyond normal levels is right around like 1916. And that was the invention of the factory. Um, so let me see how small I can make this. Well, the answer is not very small, but we see that it shoots way up. Um, and there have been plateaus since the data I showed you in the lecture notes. Um, notably, when um, some legislation was signed in, I think it was about 2014, we had a plateau when um, some world powers agreed to cut back emissions. Uh, it was the first plateau since we started measuring in the modern era. And then of course, COVID quarantine also caused actually a decrease in the CO2 emissions. The first time we've had a decrease since factories were invented. So that's really good news. It means we can make a change, right? Anyway, so sometimes people think that America um, is responsible, the US is responsible for all this, and uh, we're, we are a big contributor. We could make a big difference in this area. We're not the only ones though. So here this graph shows um, total emissions in tons, billion tons, billion trillion, what is that? I don't know, it's a lot. But anyway, so each color represents a different um, segment of our world. And as you can see, America, US is pretty big. It's a pretty big chunk of the total, um, but not the biggest. Anyway, this all affects our ocean chemistry. And that's the problem that we have is this is an equilibrium. So if you keep putting in more and more and more reactants, you're gonna keep getting more and more products and that's turning our oceans acidic, which is killing the creatures in the ocean. And so you might ask, why do I care? Well, the answer to that, besides biodiversity, which is important, Besides that, for purely selfish reasons, most of our oxygen is made in the ocean, okay? So a lot of the times people think that rainforests make our oxygen. That's what I was told as a kid. But as science has done further work, we have discovered that actually algae that live in the ocean are responsible for a huge amount of oxygen produced in our world. We need them. And so the problem is that these algae are sensitive to pH changes. They are sensitive to acidification. So these corals have a certain species of um, algae that live on them. They're symbiotic, it's pretty cool. They provide the, the photosynthesis ability and the, the, the coral skeleton provides the structure, which is calcium carbonate, by the way. So this is a relatively healthy Acropora coral. That's a little fish in the background. Um, these, by the way, are some of the most diverse ecosystems in, in, in our world. So they're important in terms of all sorts of things that apply to people. But as oceans get more and more acidic and as they warm from the global, you know, um, the climate change we're experiencing, it kills the, the coral. And so all the fish that live there can't live there anymore. It's a bad situation. And the only way to fix it is, is to have some political change and also understand what's really happening. And that takes science. This is an active area of research. There are a lot of groups trying to work on improving our ocean science and ocean chemistry. Um, and all of it's based on equilibrium. So that's why you're learning it. Um, so medicine and biology and of course chemistry it applies to um, equilibria are everywhere. So this slide is a summary of all the ways we can manipulate equilibriums that we find either in literature or your textbook. Um, so again, if I need to flip a reaction around, I just invert the value of K. If I need to double or triple or quadruple, whatever, I just take the value and raise it to that power. And if I need to have multi-step reactions, so say this is step one, this is step two, I multiply the case together. Those are super handy to remember. 